All right, so we're gonna see if this video gets recorded because it seems like everything is trying to stop me from getting this right. But I just wanna talk about this book. I really just wanna talk about this book. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. We will see what happens. Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. It's Jonathan and I'm back with another video. And today I'm going to be talking about The Secret Lives of Church Ladies by Disha Filyaw. I loved this book from the jump. I ended up buying it for one of my friends. I got it sent to her from Semicolon Bookshop, which is a black woman owned bookshop in Chicago. Hopped online, got it sent directly to her. So we've been texting about a couple of the chapters. She's a few chapters in, a few of the short stories in, and she's really enjoying it so far. So I just wanna, I wanna get into it. I wanna talk about these different stories. I wanna talk about what Disha Phil y'all covered in this book. And then just how, how it kinda, how it sat with me and just really impacted me and connected with some of the other things that I've been reading. So, um. I think that from the jump, I kind of just need to point blank cover that the experiences of people that lie at the intersection of blackness, queerness, and religion, it's just a unique experience. And I was reading Goodness and the Literary Imagination, which is a collection of essays about the work of Toni Morrison. And in the introduction, um, it's this quote from her is referenced where she says, the history of African Americans that narrows or dismisses religion in both their collective and individual life and their political and aesthetic activity is more than incomplete. It may be fraudulent. And then in addition to that, more complexity is added when you think about the fact that queer folks are living in a society that uses religion to tear them down. And I recently finished reading Salvation by Bell Hooks where she talks in her chapter titled Embracing Gayness about how given pervasive homophobia, all black gay individuals living in diverse black communities are at risk. They risk their self-esteem being assaulted by daily by a straight world that wishes to deny them equal access to a complex humanity and an array of choice on how to live and act in the world. When it comes to representation of Black queer people in media, we're just not given a whole lot. And we're not given a chance to be very complex individuals. We don't get a chance to see queer black love in so many aspects. And I tweet about this often just on my like personal account. And so I don't put it on my book Twitter, but there's just like that frustration that I often get when I see the way the black queer people are represented in media and in literature. It's always just like, it never feels like something that I personally can identify with. And I think that, you know, of course, queer people are very complex and we all have different experiences, but the way that Black queerness often revolves around whiteness is often seen through the white gaze. We never see Black queer couples. And it's one thing that, that irritates me and it really just gets under my skin because whenever you see a Black queer man in media, in movies, in TV shows, he always has a white partner. And of course there are interracial couples, that's a thing, but we never are able to exist outside of like this white gaze. We always are just under the white gaze and we're never allowed to just exist in our blackness, in our queerness. Um, and sort of in a way that where we're, we, where we're where we are existing within Black culture. It's kind of, I think that it, there's definitely a lot to be said about it. But what I feel like Disha Phil y'all does really well is that she gives voice to the women and the girls that you see every day on a Sunday morning. And she really writes this love letter to the complex humanity of Black womanhood and girlhood. And even as somebody who is a black queer man, I still can see and identify with so many of the things that were seen and felt 
that were written about in The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. I, I, I wanna get into this review. I wanna talk about this a lot more. I wanna talk about a few of the different stories. And if you have read it, you know, let me know what you think. And if you haven't read it, you know, definitely get into it. And I'm gonna try not to include like a ton of spoilers and talk about the stories too much in detail, but I do wanna talk about it. So let's get into this. So there were so many parts of this collection of short stories that really just sent me back to like the Sunday mornings at church, the, the ceiling fan spinning, you know, everybody just fanning themselves, like, you know, those hot summer mornings. It just really reminded me of home. These stories, none of them really explicitly, except one, took place within a church. Well, it's one thing to write about the experiences of people existing in the church building, but there's so much more to the lives of us that grew up in church and whose families were religious and just like the small little details and you know just like the quoting of scriptures at home and just like the communal nature of black church going people so like even in this book we get we get the one story um of Jael which um it's just a few stories in and it talks about a young girl who is being raised by her grandmother she's kind of like an an observer in this story but one of her friends starts being like invited to the home of a grown man within their community. And Jael is watching as her friend is making all of these bad decisions, all of these decisions that are being influenced by a man who has no business influencing her. And Jael is observing all of this happening Meanwhile, her grandmother is reading her diary, reading about all of this stuff is happening. But the only thing that her grandmother is focused on is Jael's sexuality. Because Jael is queer, she's expressing an interest in the first lady at the church and is writing about it in this diary. While, while her grandmother is so hard pressed to get Jael to turn away from these sinful thoughts, she is also witnessing a young girl being groomed by an older man. And you get all of these other different stories that just remind you of things that you heard when you were younger and the small little whispers that you heard um, when you weren't supposed to be listening on conversations and grown folks were talking, all the controversial things that were happening, but that nobody was really doing anything about. We get, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna have to flip through some of the stories in the book. We get stories like the, the opening story of Eula, which is literally about a woman that is, that is in denial about her sexuality and she is in a relationship with a woman, but doesn't, she's in, she's having a, she's having a romantic and sexual relationship with a woman, but because people have invalidated, invalidated same-sex partnerships in her mind, she literally still thinks that she is a virgin, even while she is having sex with a woman. And um, and she's just really invalidating Carletta, who is narrating the story, really invalidating her feelings. And um, it's just, that was one story that I was just like, oh my gosh, I can identify with this. And I really, my heart was really aching for Carletta. I honestly really just hope that she finds the love that she deserves. The One of the my favorite stories from this collection was Peach Cobbler. And you know, just, just saying that period, Peach Cobbler, if you read that story, you know. Um, my friend who I got a copy for, she literally texted me and was, and was like, I got the Peach Cobbler. And when she was digging in that trash can for that Peach Cobbler, kind of just, I think I would even say it kind of discusses, you know, how patriarchy really doesn't serve any of us, but, um, how many people begin to 
prioritize men even over their own children. Ooh, that story just was, it was definitely a lot. It definitely was a lot. Dear Sister, Dear Sister was such a great story. It, Dear Sister was such a gorgeous display of sisterhood. And even though their sisterhood was built on the common absence of one man, they, they, their relationship was really fortified by a plethora of other experiences and a lot of joy and happiness and just love. Um, and even, even a mix of pain. But one that I really, I kind of wanted to talk more about in detail, um, because I put it in my Goodreads review and it, it felt like it had one of the biggest impacts and it kind of just goes back to what I was kind of talking about um, previously when it comes to queer relationships. And um, very recently, like like literally right before I finished this video, I finished reading Salvation by Bell Hooks. And in Salvation by Bell Hooks, she talks about the representations of black love in media. And she's critiquing the way that black couples are represented in media. And her her focus is very, you know, it definitely is very heteronormative. And she mainly focuses on movies that represent um, black uh, heterosexual couples and heterosexual love. But black queer love is something that I think is is something that we don't talk about enough and that there are so few films and novels that really give us a good look at black queer love that oftentimes we don't even know how we want it to look but i definitely know how i want black queer relationships to look on film how i hope that black queer relationships look on film and this is not to say that that black queer love should only look one way However, what Bell Hooks definitely discusses in Salvation is the representation of couples where there is healthy communication, where there is love, where there is tenderness, where there is care. And this is exemplified in this short story in a way that is tear inducing. Like I swear I cried. And we often see volatile queer couples and especially when it comes to lesbians. Um, we always see like, you know, just abuse and, you know, like that. And, and that's to say, that's not to, you know, invalidate that it exists because I read In the Dream House by Carmen Marie Machado. And of course, people already don't leave people who are victims of domestic violence and intimate partner violence in queer relationships. But we often see these volatile couples and we never see anything else. But in The Secret Life of Church Ladies, in Snowfall, the story, we see positivity and we see maturity um, as this couple is reconciling their relationship. And this is actively subverting the stereotypes that we often are presented with in Black queer relationships. You have Arlita and Rhonda, and Arlita is the one who's narrating the story. And Arlita is dealing with something that a lot of queer folks deal with, which is trouble once you come out to your family members. And Arlita has come out to her mother recently, and but she is also living with her girlfriend um, and they moved across the country. And so she's, she's sort of dealing with um, the struggles of still continuing to have this, this regular normal communication with her mother um, because her mother does not understand her sexuality. Her mother does not understand the fact, does not accept her queerness fully. And, but this is still more of a relationship than Rhonda has with her mother and her family because when Rhonda came out, she was disowned, she was thrown away and she had to create her own chosen family. She had to create her own home. And so her and Lily, um, as she's called in the story, have very different ideas of what home is and what family is. And this cause, causes a rift in their relationship, but they deal with it in such a beautiful way. And reading about communication and reading about love and just healthy, love is is something that you just don't see represented and at the forefront of discussions 
in the queer community. And so I just thought that, I thought Disha Phil y'all did a wonderful job with that. And then you just get like, you get these other stories like how to make love to a physicist, which I absolutely loved. And I, you know, I would, I would watch a film based on something like that because it was just so cute and I wanted more. Like we need a follow up. You get the really juicy moments like instructions for married Christians, for married Christian husbands, which ah, uh, it was, that was, that was definitely a, a time period when I had to refill my glass of wine and really just get into the story because that was good. That was good. And it just talks about just a variety of different types of relationships and, and things that, things that just often aren't talked about. The way that this collection of short stories ended was perfect. We were provided with the perfect benediction in the form of when Eddie Levert comes. It's the story of a daughter and a mother and the mother um, has dementia and she's often um, placed a lot of her anger and frustrations and rage on her daughter. And now that her memory is going, the daughter has to sort of reconcile and deal with all of these complex emotions that she has towards her mother. And they have to work through this um, in both her mother's lucid moments and the moments when her mother is not so lucid and the way that daughters are often left taking care of so much. Meanwhile, the sons are given so much more freedom and love and Bell Hooks also talks about that in Salvation, which is why I think that Salvation is, ooh, it's, it's involved itself in a lot of what I've been reading lately. I think that The Secret Lives of Church Ladies is exactly what a short story collection should be. The stories are definitely very distinct, but they also are very linear in their theme of Black womanhood in relation to the church. So I definitely think that this is a must read. So if you have read The Secret Life of Church Ladies, let me know your thoughts in the comment section and let me know what you're reading also I'm interested uh, to know but I hope you enjoyed this video I hope you enjoyed my review I will see all of you in the next one and always remember that you are loved